Welcome, my name is Joshua, and today we are going to be studying the untold story of Nineveh. Now, of course, the story has been told, uh, but it's not told often. So we are acquainted, perhaps intimately acquainted, with the first half of the story of Nineveh. But significantly less people are acquainted with the latter half of the story. So, if you have a Bible, please grab it. We will study it together. God's Word is the only rule of faith and practice. Uh, Before we get started, briefly turn with me to the end of Luke's Gospel in uh, chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 And uh, we'll start in verse 44. Then he said to them, Jesus, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Stop. If you need to, and perhaps I'd recommend, pause this video even now and pray for that. Pray for the Lord to open the scriptures to you. We're not studying his word to know more things merely. We are studying his word to be better disciples, to worship him more purely, and to know him. And no matter how uh, efficient a messenger may seem to be, there's no messenger who can do anything apart from him. It is he who both gives the ability to deliver some message, and it is he who opens the understanding of those who hear it. I'm nothing. You're nothing. We're all nothing. God gives the increase. So if there's anything good or profitable to be had in this message, understand that it is as a direct result of his grace and nothing else. And if you're going to receive anything good here, he needs to open your understanding. I can't do that. Nobody can. For my part, I'm going to be as faithful as I can be with what I've been given here. But Jesus opens our understanding. Pray for that. We don't want to just know more things. The world is filled with people that have knowledge coming out their ears and noses. They've got knowledge of things. But they don't have knowledge of of holiness. They don't have knowledge of worship. And that's what any good study in Scripture should incline us toward. So pray for that. I've already prayed for that, but lest I be accused of praying to be seen by men. That's why I'm not doing this on camera. Um, The Lord must open our understanding to these things. No man has ever or will ever be able to do that. Understand that very clearly. So, (sighs) we're all very acquainted, likely, with the story of Nineveh as uh, recounted in the book of Jonah. Very familiar with this message of deliverance and repentance and mercy. But very few people, or less people at least, are familiar with the rest of the story, as we find in the prophet Nahum, of destruction and vengeance and justice. And it's what many people have termed Nineveh's death song. And so we are going to consider the severity of God. In the last message about failing God, if you haven't seen it, please watch it. Um, It was the intention to have these things juxtaposed. There are people who so consider the severity of God that they forgot he was good. 
as if his plan from the foundation of the world was not to redeem mankind by sending Jesus. And so those people can be tempted to despair. So we considered the goodness of God. And we ended that message with um, the verse Jesus spoke in John 5 to the man he had healed. He found him later in the temple and he says, See, you have been made well. Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Jesus said that. Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. We would do well to consider the many mercies that we have already been shown. The many backslidings, perhaps, that God has healed us from. The many wanderings he has healed us from. And sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon us. So, that's what we're going to do today in looking at Nineveh. To consider the severity of God. He is not one-dimensional. And too many people have got some strange misconception of God. Um, It's an invented God. And he lists his attributes for us throughout Scripture. Long-suffering, abounding in grace, but by no means acquitting the guilty. So, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was, uh, it's probably quoted at least 300 times, I would guess, uh, in the New Testament. Jesus quoted from the Septuagint, and in all likelihood, this was the uh, common, commonly used Bible uh, at the time. It was the Greek translation. Anyway, um, in this version, the order is different, right? Um, the, the, the order that we have our modern Bible in wasn't always the order. Um, the, the Hebrew Bible, for example, I think ends with Second Chronicles, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But in any event, the, the, it's, it's ordered just slightly different than ours. In the Septuagint, Jonah and Nahum are back-to-back. They are seen as complementary, as going together, and rightly so. Um, Ours is close, but they're separated by one book. So to begin with, I'd like to read the, um, the end of Jonah and then go right into the very beginning of Nahum. So turn to Jonah chapter 4. And then we're gonna and then we'll read immediately after that the first couple of verses in Nahum, separated, of course, by the book of Micah. So we're considering Nineveh. This is not an exhaustive exposition of either the book of Jonah or the book of Nahum, but this object of Nineveh, this story, largely seen in, in these two pictures here. So Jonah chapter four. And uh, verse 11, the Lord speaking says, And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right and their left, their right hand and their left, and much livestock? Should I not pity them? Into Nahum, the burden against Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. What happened? What happened? between showing pity, shall I not show pity to these people of Nineveh, and a burden against them, such that the Lord is preparing to to take vengeance. 
what happened? Well, um, look at verse look at verse nine. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. Verse 11, from you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor, a counselor of uh, Baal or Belial. Um, Plotting against the Lord, conspiring uh, against the Lord, just for starters. Something went wrong here. And this is a case of forsaken mercy and regression. A nation that we're all too familiar with in Jonah's account of having repented before the Lord. And yet, when met with its complement, the rest of the story, there is this burden of vengeance and justice that comes down from Nahum. And so, God's wrath was provoked. That's what happened. God's wrath was eventually provoked. Uh, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 2, I think, it says, The wrath of the king is like a roaring lion. Um, Whoever makes him angry sins against his own life. How about Psalm uh, 2 and verse 12? Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. When God's wrath is kindled, vengeance will follow. When he is provoked and conspired against, he will not at all acquit the guilty. And herein lies the problem for those that so consider God's goodness that they forgot he was severe. Lest you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little, we read in Psalm 2. So, that's what happened. Understand that the more knowledge that is given, the more mercy that is forsaken, the greater will be the judgment following. To whom much has been given, much will be required. What light was sent into Nineveh through Jonah and then forsaken? How much light has been given you? How much mercy has been shown you? Because the greater that portion is, if it is forsaken, the greater the judgment is at the tail end. To whom much is given, much will be required. Remember when Jesus rebuked the cities that he did his mighty works in. He rebukes Capernaum, for example, and says, um, uh, you, uh, Capernaum, um, who are in the heavens, um, you will be brought down to Hades. Something like this. You will be brought down to Hades, he says. And if the mighty works that were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. Therefore, he says, it will be more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. More tolerable for Sodom than for Capernaum? How is that possible? Question. Did Capernaum engage in the same wickedness on the surface that Sodom did? No. There's absolutely no indication of that. It was not a matter of the wickedness that they engaged in, per se, but the amount of light and revelation that they forsook Understand this concept. Let me say that again. It was not the degree of wickedness that they engaged in per se, but it was the amount of light or revelation that they forsook that netted them a greater judgment. 
Do you understand the weight of this concept all by itself? Sodom, he says, would have remained to this day. So great, so magnificent were the things that Jesus, God incarnate, God became flesh, did for them, and they didn't repent. It will be more tolerable for people who apparently engaged in more wicked behavior because the light that they had wasn't nearly the amount of light that you had. Get a grasp on that concept. It's a frightening concept. More tolerable for an apparently more wicked nation. Why? Because you, Capernaum, forsook so much more. You were given so much more, and you did what with it? You rejected it. If God has given you wisdom or insight... shown you mercies, uh, allowed you spiritual insights, all of these things understand that the more knowledge you possess, the greater your judgment. There's a reason Paul said about teachers, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that um, you will endure a stricter judgment. Everybody will not be judged by the same standard. To whom much is given, much will be required. Every bit of light that you receive, every bit of revelation, every time you hear a verse of Scripture, all of that will either make your glory all the more or your judgment all the more. Think of that. The next time you think of Sodom and how wicked and awful it was, remember that Jesus said it will be more tolerable for them than for Capernaum. Not as much for what they did, but that they rejected him. So Jonah, let's recap just briefly, even though we're all very familiar, in in what's going on here in Nineveh. Now, first of all, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. A In Jonah's account, a few times, it is referenced as a great city, a great city, and even an exceedingly great city, I think in chapter 3, the exceedingly great city of Nineveh, and at one time, perhaps the greatest city in the world. Indeed, it was a great city. God himself calls it a great city. It was a very affluent uh, trade center. And uh, at one point was um, referred to as the New Babylon. New Babylon. After something of a conquest of Babylon. Nineveh was indeed a great city. In fact, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world, perhaps might rightly, uh, ought to rightly be termed the Hanging Gardens of Nineveh. There is uh, research to suggest that the location has been misplaced in our minds for quite a long time. There is no firsthand reference to these hanging gardens in Babylon. That came later. And so when archaeologists began excavating and searching for these hanging gardens in, in Babylon, they couldn't find them. They began to think, maybe it's a myth. And a few Assyriologists in uh, looking into um, Assyrian writings and and, um, the excavations of Nineveh, uh, have discovered uh, quite an elaborate uh, aqueduct system and so forth. And it appears rather that it's likely that not Nebuchadnezzar built the Hanging Gardens in Babylon, but rather King Sennacherib of Syria, the man who harassed Hezekiah. There are inscriptions with his name on it, referencing these diverted waterways and this aqueduct system and so forth. And so as Syria was referred to as New Babylon, it is very likely, actually, that the hanging gardens we thought were in Babylon for so long are actually in Nineveh. Something for you to consider and uh, check out for yourself at your own leisure. In any event, 
Nineveh was an exceedingly great city is the point. And for such a great city, it's curious, Jonah didn't want to go. Well, it's, it's more complicated than that. But it was not just great in its influence and its affluence, but it was a great city in terms of its brutality and its utter cruelty. Nineveh, I mean, uh, Assyria, the whole empire, Nineveh being its capital, was among the most brutal empires in world history ever. Even by pagan, barbaric standards, Assyria was basically at the top. They menaced every nation around them and were unrelenting. Torturing their enemies, impaling them. Just this slow, cruel death. Cutting out their tongues, gouging out their eyes, for example. Um, Making men um, grind the bones of their ancestors into powder so there was no trace of them left. Just psychologically torturous. They would flay people skin them, and you, alive, by the way, skinning them alive and and placing their skin on the walls outside the city. About as cruel as it gets, perhaps with that in mind, it's a little more understandable why Jonah made the decision to run away in any event. With that in mind, to see what happens in Jonah's uh, story is... Amazing, absolutely amazing. This monumental act of repentance in Nineveh, it was unthinkable. But you see this marvelous thing take place when Jonah goes and uh, preaches to them. In fact, let's read it in in Jonah chapter 3. Okay, Jonah chapter 3. Okay. This is after the fish has spit up Jonah on dry land or vomited him up on dry land. And for the record, Jesus makes a reference to this. Yes, historically, literally, actually happened. Yes, Jonah was swallowed by this fish. Yes, survived in its belly. Jesus makes a reference to it as a a literal event. So... Don't let anybody tell you differently. It's a, it's a philosophically inconsistent uh, train of thought to say, yes, I believe God spoke the worlds into existence, but it's unfathomable that he could uh, sustain the life of Jonah in the belly of a fish. You've got a, a strange and inconsistent uh, worldview. It is more than fathomable. All right? Yes, it is a miracle. So... By definition, this is not something that would normally happen. No, it's not normal, that's true. But it actually happened. It's not normal for people to walk on water or to be raised from the dead, but those things did happen. So too with the fish. In any event, verse 1 of chapter 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, And preach the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And that's how we should always go in all of our doings. According to the word of the Lord. In every aspect of your life, when you get up and go, in your waking and your sleeping and everything, do it according to the word of the Lord. Search his word out to know his will in everything so far as you can. According to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. This is all we read right here. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them than the word of the king. The word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself, 
it with sackcloth, sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let every one turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell? If God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Indeed, a beautiful picture of God's mercy toward a Gentile nation. It was a rather quick repentance. All we read is, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And they repented so completely that the king set aside his robe and made a decree for the whole nation. Why? What happened here? Now, I'm going to offer something just for your consideration. This is not a point of dogma, but it's an interesting historical uh, perhaps relevance here, that in 763 BC, there is a, a solar eclipse that was recorded by the Assyrians that coincides with the time and life of Jonah. Now, it could be, I'm just throwing this out for your consideration, that this documented solar eclipse may have had something to do with this very quick repentance. Now, perhaps Jonah said more than this, and this is all that's recorded. That's also possible too. But it is interesting to note that an eclipse for the, th these people of Nineveh was an omen. And here's what they would have seen that if indeed... Now, this eclipse did happen. The question is, did it happen when Jonah was there? The, the timeline fits. It could have. An eclipse for the Assyrians would have signified this, an omen that the king was going to be deposed and killed, replaced with a worthless individual, that uh, there would be flooding from the heavens and that the gates of the city would be completely washed away. Now, could it be that God used this providentially as a, a means of confirming Jonah's word to them with their own notions? Well, it's certainly possible. I only throw that out as a point of consideration for yourself. It is an interesting historical tidbit. In any event, they repented. They did repent, and Jesus uh, confirms this in Matthew chapter 12. He says that um, the men of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. And he's um, re rebuking these men in front of him uh, who are asking for a sign and so forth. He says, but I tell you, a greater than Jonah is here. But Jesus does again confirm they did repent. They repented at the preaching of Jonah. They believed the Lord. Now look at uh, verse 6. The word came to the king of Nineveh. And he makes this decree. Verse 10, now look. Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented. I want you to notice the connection between the king and his people. This is a huge deal and helps explain a lot of things in, throughout history. The king was involved in this dependence and it says uh, with his nobles, there was a decree of the king and his nobles saying everybody's going to be involved in this. So the king believed. It's a very good sign when the leadership of a nation fears God. Generally speaking, there are exceptions to most everything, but generally speaking, the leadership of a nation reflects the spiritual and moral temperature of the people. Generally speaking, 
even if the people don't like the leader, some particular leader, they become overtly tyrannical or some something, they are still generally a reflection of the moral and spiritual temperature of, of the people. And uh, case in point, look around you. In my own context, if you're watching from another country, then uh, you know uh, think about it in your context. But in the United States, for example, you can take cities like New York or Los Angeles. They're very uh, liberal, um, you know, politically speaking. And generally, th- these are people that um, are opposed to anything even approaching biblical. Um, these cities are very liberal, God-hating cities, and they're awful. And the results of it are awful. Uh, homelessness, uh, rampant, law-breaking, uh, smash-and-grab robberies. It's astounding. Oppression, etc. But how did they get like this? The people that live in those cities voted, presumably, things are strange in America sometimes, presumably voted for these leaders. So, Though it, it's, it's, it's interesting to note that the mass exodus is happening in some of these cities. People are fleeing New York and California, for example, and they're moving to places like Austin, Texas. Now, what's happened in Austin, Texas? 10% rise in homelessness in the last year? Their ideologies produced the environment that they don't like. These leaders are just a reflection of them even when they don't like it. Generally speaking, they deserve it. And we do. So, when the leadership of a nation hates God, when they reject any inclination toward the fear of the Lord, it is generally a reflection of the people at large. Of course, there are pockets of people who are in something like collateral damage, who don't agree with any of it. But by and large, the leadership is a reflection of the people. And so the hearts of these Ninevites are knit to their kings and nobles, and it says they repented. God saw their works, and they turned from their evil way. So they repented. But regression and spiritual decline uh, doesn't take long. In fact, it can happen pretty quickly. And so it did here. Perhaps within 40 to 50 years, the Assyrians went and attacked Israel, the 10 northern tribes, and took them into captivity. About 70 years after that, Nahum is sent to prophesy judgment against them, and about 40 years after that, they are completely and utterly destroyed. Doesn't take long. This monumental and just astounding act of repentance was followed up not long after with regression. So, You think about those seeds that are sown on stony path that spring up for a moment but have no root in themselves. Or the seeds that are uh, sown among thorns and the cares of the world choke them out. Or Demas, who forsook Paul. Remember, Paul writes, Demas has forsaken me. He was his fellow laborer in the New Testament. Beware of spiritual regression. Beware of of those little sins. Beware of the cares of the world. Beware of not having root in yourself. It doesn't take long. Enthusiasm will not sustain you. You need to be rooted and grounded in God's word, completely sold to him. Regard him as your owner, your owner and your governor and your ruler, period, end of story. Doesn't take long. 
and they are destroyed, utterly, completely and utterly destroyed. A writer named Lucian in the second century says, no trace of it remains. By the second century, even, no trace of it remains. That's how utterly destroyed Nineveh was in just a short time. From this, God saw their works that they turned from evil, and he said um, he relented. From the disaster, he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. By the second century, you have writers saying there's not even a trace of it. We don't even know where it is. In fact, just a few hundred years after that, uh, after this, after Jonah left, Alexander the uh, Alexander the Great was marching through this area and apparently had no clue there was even ever a city there. Within a few hundred years, there was no trace of Nineveh. It was just a memory. Not until the mid-19th century, when it was unearthed by one of the Bible's best friends, archaeology, uh, a man named uh, Austin Henry Laird um, discovered Nineveh in the mid-19th century, I think 1846 or something. There was no trace of it completely destroyed. And we'll talk more about the archaeological aspects a bit later. Doesn't take long, but let's get some time perspective here. Because from an historical perspective, this didn't take long at all. I mean, from the from the time of uh, Jonah to its ultimate, you know, destruction. Depending on the timelines, I mean, you're looking at a, a hundred and sixty years or something like that. Historically, that's very short, very short. But from an individual perspective, that might seem like a long time. You know, at the point that they start regressing and going back till the time judgment actually comes, well over a hundred years pass. And they, not to mention other people around, might have been inclined to look at this and say, nothing's happening, nothing happened. Nothing happened. So, again, even from the time of Nahum's prophecy of judgment till the time of its culmination was at least 40 years, 40 to 50 years, something like that. Now again, historically, that's really quick. But to the boots on the ground, that's decades, right? And people might be inclined to say, boy, judgment's not happening. Where is judgment? Understand that there is a radical difference between sentence and execution. Um, they are related, but don't mistake the two. The, the average death row inmate, for example, in America, sits on death row for 22 years. This is after they've been sentenced. That's how long the appeals process takes and so forth. The average death row inmate will sit there for over two decades before the execution. It doesn't alter the sentence. Judgment has already come down. Uh, but there can be um, some Im impatience, perhaps, that sets in, because when the gavel finally falls, the sentence is irrevocable. That doesn't mean you're going to see the culmination of it immediately. But when God makes the final pronouncement, it's going to happen. And indeed, it, it did. In, w w with specificity, down to the minutest detail of what Nahum said was going to happen. It's interesting to note what Jonah says. It's, we don't get any details. He just says Nineveh will be overthrown in 40 days. Nahum's account is quite different. It is very, very detailed. And so, 
Nahum wasn't sent to Nineveh like Jonah was. Why not? See, God sent Jonah to go preach to Nineveh, to give them a chance. Why wouldn't he do that again with Nahum? Why didn't he send him there? Now, Nineveh is addressed in, in Nahum's book. But there's no indication that he was sent there at all or that he went there. What does God say? My spirit will not always strive with man or will not strive with man forever. There comes a point when mercy has been extended and extended and forsaken and forsaken. And then Nahum is sent to pronounce the final judgment. But he isn't sent to Nineveh in the way that Jonah was. It's interesting to note. My spirit will not strive with man forever. What does Proverbs 29.1 say? A man who is rebuked often and stiffens his neck will be destroyed suddenly and that without remedy. Rebuked often. There are these many rebukes that come down and the neck is stiffened and the heart is hardened. Eventually, they will be destroyed suddenly and that without remedy. And we see something of that take place here in the case of Nineveh. God eventually will take vengeance on his enemy. He is not slack. Eventually, it will happen. But he has many purposes in what he's doing. You understand the manifold purposes of God in allowing wicked to prosper, as Jeremiah says. In Jeremiah chapter 12, he says, Lord, why do the, uh, why do the wicked prosper? And why are they happy that, act, that deal treacherously? It's an honest question. I bet many of us have asked that. We look around us, we see corruption everywhere. Why? Why do they get away with it? They're just getting away with it. There's no justice. It's lawlessness. Don't question God's judgment and his timing in his judgment. He has manifold purposes in allowing wicked to prosper. In fact, one of them is the the use of the wicked as an instrument of judgment, which is precisely what God was doing with the Assyrians. He used them as an instrument of judgment on many people, but including his own, who should have known better, including Israel, who should have known better. In uh, Amos chapter 6, I think in verse 14, it says, I will raise up a nation against you. I will raise up a nation against you. And so wicked nations are used by God as an instrument of judgment against those who should know better, against those who are being disobedient. In fact, understand while we're considering this nation, let's go to 2 Kings just briefly. 2 Kings chapter uh, 17. And we're just going to look at a brief overview of what was going on in Israel at this time. Okay, so Assyria is besieging everything around. Verse 7, So it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Um, Verse 9, also the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built high places and cities, etc. They set up pillars on every, um, uh, they set up, sorry, uh, for themselves sacred pillars and uh, wooden images. <clears throat> they burned incense in high places, verse 11. Verse 12, they served idols uh, for which the Lord had said to him, you shall not do this thing. Um 
Uh, Verse 14, listen, Nevertheless, they would not hear, but stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers and did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and, and his covenant that he made with their fathers and testimonies which he testified against them. They followed idols. They became idolaters. Um, they made molded image images. Verse 17, they caused their sons and daughters to pass through fire and practice witchcraft and soothsaying and uh, sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. It was really bad. Uh, verse 20, And the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, afflicted them, and delivered them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them from his sight. For he tore Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king, and Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them commit great sin. There you go, another leader enticing people to sin, a reflection of them. Verse 22, for the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did and did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria as it is to this day. It was bad news in Israel. And one of God's purposes in allowing Israel the Assyrians to go on a rampage, to increase in wickedness, was as an instrument of his judgment and punishment against others, including his own people who should have known better. That's one. But he uses wicked for good as well. Not just as an instrument of judgment, but as an instrument to bring about good as well. We see examples of this in the life of Joseph. For example, notice this. The wickedness of Joseph's brothers in selling him into slavery was used to elevate Joseph to such a place that he was there to deliver an entire nation. The wickedness of Haman, perpetuated against Esther, was used to elevate her to such a place that she was used to deliver an entire nation. The wickedness of Judas and the religious hypocrites in the Sanhedrin in falsely condemning Jesus was used to elevate him to such a place that he delivered an entire world whosoever would come to him. Do you see how God doesn't work despite evil, but directly through it? He's not in heaven improvising and playing chess with the devil, as some would have you think. Ah, well, I didn't expect this one from Satan. I got to outsmart him with a clever move. No, no, no. He is working directly through it. And we see this time and time again. For those who are in the path of obedience with the Lord, all things are working together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. That verse does not mean that all things are working for your immediate and temporal happiness. That's not what it means. You may never see or understand exactly why such and such happened. Not now. But in glory, you'll look back through this corridor of time and see just how magnificently Our God was orchestrating everything to accomplish his purposes. The good that was brought about through things that were so wicked. Look how wicked the betrayal of Jesus was. And it was all for the good of humanity. It was all for the good of those that were to be redeemed. If I look at a particular moment, if I, if I view everything through a peephole, I'll be discouraged immediately. No, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. So you might be tempted to look around you and say, I don't understand why this is happening or why this person's getting away with it or why this nation is so corrupt. Of course you don't. 
don't expect to see full justice executed uh, on this earth, and don't expect to understand the full goodness that God is working out through these injustices while on earth. It will come in due time. For now, we remain faithful to the Lord. He is using it masterfully. Even when Sennacherib is uh, uh, boasted of of what he was going to do to to Hezekiah, the Lord says to him um, something to the effect of, you know, you're boasting about all these kingdoms that you've torn down and nobody can stand in your way. Don't you know? Don't you know this was part of my plan? Don't you know that's why these nations had no power over you? Now, God is not the author of evil. This does not vindicate the wicked. Understand this. There are some foolish notions to the contrary. God is not the author of evil. God didn't force anybody to sin. But he uses it. He's not the author of it. God was not the author of the betrayal of Judas. Jesus says, offense must come, but woe to him through whom it comes. It would have been better if he had never been born. No surprise. Absolutely according to his plan, and yet they're not vindicated at all. He's using them. They are simultaneously, listen, simultaneously instruments of his wrath, Instruments of his punishment and objects of his wrath. How about that? Simultaneously, these wicked nations and even wicked people can be used by God as instruments of judgment and are also objects of his wrath. Don't be confounded by this. He's using it. He allowed Syria, uh, Assyria, to go and destroy Israel. Why? Because Israel was wicked. So he used it. And on the other hand, we see the good that God works through these deliverances in the person of Joseph or in Esther or in our Lord Jesus. All of them had wicked intentions directed at them that God was using for the good of those who were the called, who loved God and were the called according to his purposes. See how God uses wickedness in manifold ways and understand you're not in a place to question his judgment or his timing in it. You be faithful to the Lord. By all means, be confused and cast it to the Lord. I don't understand this. Great. You may never understand it. It's not yours to understand. What you can and should understand is that the Lord is good. He does what's right. I have every cause to put my trust and absolute faith in him, and I don't need to worry about the things that I don't understand. So we can all understand Jeremiah's question, why do the wicked prosper? Why are they so happy who deal treacherously? Consider their end. Consider their end. And consider the lip service of some, because woe to you if you give God lip service like Israel did. An instrument of wickedness may be raised up against you. Look what Israel did while we're considering Nineveh. Look what Israel did. They forsook the Lord. They rejected him. They hardened their hearts. They didn't want anything to do with him. So he raises up this instrument of wickedness against them. Woe to you if you're near to God with your lips, but your hearts are far from him. Don't be surprised when some wicked instrument is raised up against you. In fact, we're going to read a citation from Richard Baxter here from uh, 
his work called uh, A Christian Directory. This is in part one. About the so-called prosperity of the wicked. Listen. But alas, how short is the prosperity of the wicked. Read Psalm um, 73 and 37, he says. Delay is no forgiveness. Delay is no forgiveness. Remember, we talked about deferred judgment, how it can give a, a false sense of security. Well, the sentence already came down. It doesn't change the sentence because there appears to be some deferment in the culmination. Delay is no forgiveness, just like for the death row inmate. 22 years doesn't mean it's not coming. But stay, they stay but till the assize, until the judgment. And will that tempt you to do as they? How unthankfully do sinners deal with God? If he should kill you and plague you, that would not please you. And yet if he forbear you, you are emboldened by it in your sin. Thus his patience is turned against him, but the stroke will be the heavier when it falls. Dost thou think those men will always flourish? Will they always domineer and revel? Will they, uh, will they always dwell in houses where they now dwell and possess those lands and be honored and served as they now are? Oh, how quickly and how dreadfully will the case be changed with them. Oh, could you but foresee now what faces they will have and what heavy hearts and with what bitter exclamations they will at last cry out against themselves for all their folly and wish they had never been deceived by prosperity, but rather had the portion of a Lazarus. If you saw how they are but fatted for the slaughter, and in what a dolorous misery, a grievous misery, their wealth and sport and honors will leave them, you would lament their case and think so great a destruction were soon enough, and not desire to be partners in their lot. Consider the end of those that appear to be prospering, both nationally and individually. Judgment will come in God's perfect timing, while he is working out both punishments for those to whom it is directed and working good for those that love the Lord through these same instruments. Remember, simultaneously, one can be a, a, an instrument of judgment in God's hand and also an object of his wrath. They are being fatted for the slaughter. So we come to Nahum. The sentence of vengeance and justice. After all of this, let me just point out, Nahum, we don't know almost anything about him except where he's from, and we don't even really know exactly where that was. There's speculation, but nothing concrete. Just this obscure prophet God uses the lightly esteemed. Nahum, the Alkoshite, that, that's all we have. Now, there are other people in Scripture that we know more about, but there's a general principle here for you to consider. This is not a man who made much of himself or was using his office as a prophet to increase his own stock or notoriety or what have you, notability. This wasn't um, a platform for him, uh, you know, to use as a, a, a personal therapy session. Hey guys, I'm Nahum. When you hear that sort of garbage, hey guys, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Unlike it and unsubscribe it and don't ever go back. These are superficial, self-ambitious, pathetic men and women. 
They, they use uh, under the guise and the cloak of ministry. It's some personal therapy session or vlogging session for them. That's not the work of a minister. Nathan Nahum went to work. And he did what the Lord called him to do, not in making much of himself and so on and so forth. He didn't desire to be known. There wasn't a, there's not a problem with being known per se, but there's a problem with the desire. People knew who John the Baptist were. People knew who Jesus was. In any event, we don't know anything about Nahum other than his name and the exactness of these pronouncements that God had given to him. Probably during the uh, reign of Manasseh, wicked King Manasseh, very likely um, around that time. Let's read uh, chapter 3 briefly of Nahum. Nahum chapter 3, and we'll read, um, starting in verse 1, Woe to the bloody city! It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. Verse um, 5, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift up your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? A harsh pronouncement of judgment from beginning to end. Nahum has nothing positive to say. And most of modern Christendom would call Nahum mean and judgmental. You can hear it now. Ripped out of all meaning and context, you could hear a group of people standing around in their sun hats pointing at Nahum saying, if you're without sin, cast the first stone. This is the sad, pathetic state of so-called Christianity, in, in, in much of the Western world, at least. He's just mean. He's just judgmental. Doesn't he have anything positive to say? Just out here pronouncing judgment. You're no better than them, Nahum. What makes you better than Nineveh? Aren't you a sinner too? Understand what's happening here and understand your position. When people level these baseless, it will never stop. It will always be like this. Ignorant people will say ignorant things. Emotional people will say things that don't make any sense. They betray their own disdain of God when they say such foolish things. It's so mean. It's so judgmental. Nahum went according to the command of the Lord. He pronounced judgment based on what God had revealed to him. So to you, if there is something worth judging or condemning according to God's word, let them revile, let them accuse, let them do what they're going to do. They're not fighting against you. Who are you to judge? I'm nobody. I'm not judging you. God's word already did. I'm just letting you know. And if you have a problem with it, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with him. Point them back to his word, according to the word of the Lord. X, Y, and Z. Here's God's judgment. I'm just relaying the information. So Nahum has nothing positive to say because there is nothing positive to say. Not everything has a positive message for everybody anyway. There was comfort, which that's what his name actually means. There was comfort in what Nahum was saying for Judah, who seems to be the, the, the message was primarily uh, directed at. It was the burden against Nineveh, but, you know, you'll read in there later, you know, keep your solemn feasts and so forth. Of course, they were being harassed by the Assyrians, so there was some messages uh, of comfort for Judah. 
And for every nation, nobody liked Assyria. They were this bad and brutal. But there is nothing positive to say. It is a pronouncement of judgment according to the word of the Lord. That's what needed to be said, and that's what he said. There's no apologies about it. This is what God said. If you have a problem with it, take it up with him. Look at, um, look at chapter 2. Nahum chapter 2. Um, verse 1, for example. He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. Verse 10. She is empty, desolate, and waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is on every side and all the faces are drained of color. There is biting, mocking, and sarcasm in these words. Look at what he tells them. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. There's no hope. Your knees are going to be knocking. Your faces will be drained of color. Was he being mean? No. Was he being judgmental? Not personally. He was judging according to righteous judgment. It is the Lord's judgment. He's already judged you. I'm just letting you know. So when somebody tells you you're just mean, you're just judgmental, if you're without sin, cast the first stone. People that say this are doing it to excuse something. With no self-awareness whatsoever, they have no problem with judging you for judging. But how dare you judge them? It's a common, irrational theme uh, you will experience if you ever dare to speak truth. Now, what he's saying here, understand that Assyria is at their peak strength at this time. It, it almost doesn't make sense. How could, how could Nineveh fall? I mean, the Assyrian Empire is so strong. This city is so great. God is not mocked. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. God will let the strength increase just to show that he's stronger. You think you're invincible? Okay, watch this. Beware of that spirit of pride uh, welling in you personally. Beware of that. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. And whatever a nation sows, they will reap too. There's, there's no secure nation. All of them are eventually going to fall. Ah, but they're so great. They're so mighty. All of them were. They were all so great and mighty. All of these cities that have fallen, they were all so great and so mighty. They're no match for the Lord. He can destroy any one of them in a second if he wanted to. He uses them accordingly, according to his own purposes. Don't think you have anything that's not a gift. And when these nations rise to prominence and they get full of themselves, it's, it's a satanic pride. Self-reliance will be your undoing and the undoing of every nation uh, eventually. But they were, at this time, as barbaric as ever before. Remember, we talked about how brutal the Assyrians were. Arguably, at this time, since Jonah, they're worse. 
Uh, remember, Jesus says when an unclean spirit departs from a man and it goes through dry places, he, he says, I'll go back to where I came from. And when he does, he takes seven spirits more wicked than himself. And the last state is worse than the first. Look what happens when mercy is forsaken. When light is darkened and repentance is thrown off. The last state becomes worse than the first, not only in their barbarism and so forth, but in the judgment that is coming to them. Everything about it is worse. And so Nahum, uh, let's go back to, uh, to chapter 2 here, begins to, in, to, to speak about their judgment with just stunning accuracy and, and detail. Let's start in... Verse verse 3, chapter 2 and verse 3. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another uh, in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk and make haste to her walls. And the defense is prepared, the gates and the rivers are opened, and the place is dissolved. Uh, turn, turn back to chapter 3. Um, verse 2, the noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, horsemen charge with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, great numbers of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses because of the multitude of harlotries and the seductive of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries, who's, who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face and will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you and make you vile and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee. We read this just a moment ago. This this is a, a poem, uh, the way Nahum is written. The detail is exquisite, and it happened exactly like this. The accuracy of God's word is revealed time and time again in every uh, instant uh, instance. So you have, um, let me read uh, before we quote this, uh, we'll read from chapter 1 and verse 8 real quick. He says, but with an overflowing flood... He will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies with an overflowing flood. Twice there's a flood mentioned. This this literally happened. The Tigris River, during a drunken feast, apparently, literally overflowed and washed away the foundations of the palace and the gates of the city, and allowed the Babylonians and the Medes, who had been attacking Nineveh for a couple of years at that point, to enter, to flood in, and destroy it. Everything Nahum said, every single thing came to pass, exactly as he said it. The man earlier that we uh, quoted, um, Austin Henry Layard, who discovered Nineveh, wrote uh, wrote a book called Discoveries uh, at Nineveh. Here's what he says. The palace had been destroyed by fire. The alabaster slabs were almost reduced to lime, and many of them fell to pieces as soon as uncovered. The places which others had occupied could only be traced by a thin white deposit like a coat of plaster left by the burnt alabaster upon the wall of sun-dried bricks. This was the extent of my discoveries at Nineveh. From the dimensions of some of the halls, it is evident that the ruins are those of a building of great extent and magnificent magnificence. The mound upon which it stood was once washed by the river. Nineveh, the wonder of the ancient world and her fall, the theme of the prophets, is the signal most instance of divine vengeance, 
Without the evidence that these monuments afford, we might have doubted that the great Nineveh ever existed. So completely, quote, has she become a desolation and a waste. It's incredible. So completely has she become a desolation and a, and a, and a waste. Um, Zephaniah says something similar in uh, Zephaniah chapter 2. And uh, verse thir- starting in verse th- uh, 13, he says, And he will stretch out his hand against the north, destroy Assyria, and make Nineveh a desolation. As dry as the wilderness, the herds shall lie down in her midst. Every beast of the nation, both the pelican and the, the bittern, shall lodge on the capitals of her pillars. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be at the threshold, for he will lay bare the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt securely, that said in her heart, I am it, and there's none besides me. How has she become a desolation? A place for every beast to lie down. Everyone who passes by her shall hiss and shake his fist. And again, one of the Bible's best friends, archaeology, comes to confirm God's word with absolute precision. It happened. Completely destroyed. Ezekiel goes on to talk about the destruction uh, of Nineveh in uh, chapter 32. I'll just read it briefly. Um, Ezekiel chapter 32. He's talking about other nations that are going to be destroyed. They shall fall in the midst of those slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword, drawing her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with with those who help him. They have gone down. They lie with the uncircumcised slain by the sword. Assyria is there and all her company. With their graves all around her, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, her graves are set in the recesses of the pit and her company is all around her grave. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, who caused terror in the land of the living." They caused terror to everyone around them, and their own methods were used against them. The same people that made others tremble like women, we are told that they themselves were going to be uh, made to tremble like women. And in fact, in uh, chapter 3 of Nahum, in verse 8, it says, Are you better than no Ammon? that was situated by the river, this is Thebes, that had the waters around her whose rampart was the sea and whose wall was the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was boundless. Put and Lubim were your helpers. Yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. This is the city of Thebes. And God is reminding them and saying, are are you any better than them? They went into captivity. Well, guess what? It was Assyria who took Thebes captive, who did about 10 to 20 years prior to this. They were intimately acquainted with what happened because they were the ones that took them captive. And God is telling them, you remember what you did to Thebes? You think you're better than them? It's going to happen to you in exactly the same way. God used their menacing uh, methods against them. And in fact, if we keep reading a little bit further uh, in chapter 3, verse 13, Surely your people in your midst are women. The gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. Draw your water for the siege, fortify your strongholds, go into the clay and tread the mortar, make strong the brick kiln. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off, it will eat you up like a locust. Make yourself many like the locust, make yourself many like the swarming locust. 
You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders and flies away. Your commanders are like swarming locusts and gr- generals like grasshoppers, which camp on the hedges on a cold day. When the sun rises, they flee away, and the place where they rest is not known. Surely your people are like women. You're going to be like frightened women in the street, all of you, for all of the terror and affliction. God uses their methods against them. You live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. That's the judgment that you used on these people. That's the judgment that's going to be used against you. God is not mocked. It will happen eventually. You may not see it all, but you will reap what you sow. So be careful what you sow. Are you sowing to the flesh or are you sowing to the spirit? We're told to sow to the spirit. Are you sowing righteousness or are you sowing disobedience? God is not mocked, but there were many warnings forsaken after even the time of Jonah. Still, warnings were forsaken. Still, when Sennacherib is harassing uh, Hezekiah, and Hezekiah prays to the Lord, and the prophet Isaiah says, "Uh, don't fear, God's going to send him out exactly the way he came. Overnight, the angel of the Lord slays 185,000 of the army of Sennacherib, the Assyrian army. Overnight, 185,000 dead. Sennacherib leaves, goes back home, goes back to Nineveh. At some point later, he's worshiping in the temple of his pagan god, and two of his sons assassinate him, kill him. You would think the loss of 185,000 soldiers and then shortly followed up with the assassination of your king, might be an affliction that would prompt you to think about what it is you're doing, the nature of your ways. Perhaps to even call to mind that distant story of Jonah that you may have heard about. Warnings and afflictions were sent even after Jonah. But if you forsake those warnings... If you forsake those afflictions and you put off repentance, vengeance is coming for you. In fact, let's read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. For those who are Enemies of God, like Nineveh had become. Understand that every warning and every affliction that's forsaken will make the judgment worse, and it will come. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Rest when? When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Don't expect your rest here. This is not your rest, pilgrim. We're passing through. We're pilgrims and sojourners passing through. We have a rest elsewhere. Richard Baxter wrote extensively about this in a a work called The Saints' Everlasting Rest. Read it. You're not to expect rest here. We will have rest when he comes. When he is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, listen, verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints 
and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Jesus will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will come and he will judge in flaming fire, taking vengeance. That's what awaits those who stay enemies of God, who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If that's you, you are being fattened for the slaughter. If that's you, perhaps this is one of God's warnings to you, to listen, to wake up, to repent, and to believe. Today, if you will hear his voice, turn to the Lord. Don't harden your hearts. This day is the day of salvation. What do you think you have to gain by rejecting the Lord? I'll tell you what you have to gain. Eternal misery. And you stand to lose joys that have not even entered into the hearts of men. You stand to lose fellowship with God himself forever and ever and ever. He will come and he will judge. And now, now is the time. Because it is appointed for every man to die once and after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9.27. It will come. And that's it. And if you're an enemy of God, take heed to what happened at Nineveh. God destroyed them. And note this. Go back to Nahum chapter 3. The very last verse, Nahum chapter 3 and verse 19. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? So despised was Nineveh at this point that everybody was going to rejoice at her plundering and destruction. They will clap their hands over you. And he says, your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. God forbid that sentence. Remember, the execution of this, the culmination of this didn't come for at least another 40 years. Some people say a little less, but give or take, about 40 years. It didn't happen immediately, but when it did, it was irrevocable. God will not strive with you forever. And if he's calling you to himself, repent and believe the gospel now, today. Put off everything. This world doesn't matter. And run to Jesus with all the swiftness that you can. Put your faith and your trust in him. Forsake your sins. And trust in him alone for your salvation. Because there will come a time when your injury will have no healing and your wound will be severe. In fact, in Revelation chapter 18, Revelation chapter 18, and verse starting in uh, 19, They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. Verse 20, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Rejoice over her. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor belong to God, 
to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the living creatures and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Look at the rejoicing that takes place when God finally avenges those people who were his enemies and who were the enemies of the saints. You read something like this in Psalm 58. There will be rejoicing at his vengeance, over his vengeance. And it will be complete. So to the saint and the Lord, all of our enemies will be destroyed. You see a small picture of this in what was happening at Nineveh and the comfort that perhaps Judah received in this message. Ah, our enemies will finally be destroyed. Eventually, all of our enemies, every enemy of God and therefore of his saints, we are members of Christ, will be destroyed absolutely and forever. All of them. You will be saved from the very presence of sin forever and ever, from the very presence of sorrow forever and ever. The adversary of your souls, the devil, will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. God will vanquish all of his enemies, and therefore all of your enemies, thoroughly. You're not going to see it all take place while we're here. But that's what's coming. And there will be rejoicing. We will be among those whom John prophesied about, that we just read about, rejoicing over God's judgment and saving us from the presence of these enemies forever and ever. And so in that, there is comfort. It sounds almost harsh. Would you rejoice over those being judged by God? You heard them. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The the Lord has avenged her on us. That killed the saints. That persecuted her, etc. There will be rejoicing. That we won't have to deal with those enemies nor the enemy of the flesh forever. So eventually, all of our enemies, remember what happened in Nineveh, how completely God destroyed it. Not a trace of her remains, said Lucian. Not a trace of her. We can't even find where Nineveh was. So too shall be the enemies of God. Not a trace of them will remain. Not a trace of your sin will remain. It will all be completely eradicated. What a blessing find the hope even in this pronouncement of judgment that came down upon Nineveh, that eventually those who are enemies of the Lord and therefore enemies of us will be completely and utterly removed from our presence forever and ever. And we will rejoice and clap our hands and find rest. Rest with the Lord forever. Hallelujah indeed. But there's a sad epilogue to this story, which is this. Nineveh was completely destroyed in about 612 BC. Again, give or take, not, there's not an absolute consensus, but right about 612 BC. And within about 20 year, 25 years from that time, Jerusalem was destroyed, Solomon's temple was destroyed, and Judah was taken captive by Babylon. 
within 25 years, and the sieges began sooner than that. But over the course of the next 25 years, the very people who would have received some comfort from this message of Nahum, keep your solemn feast, Judah. You don't have to worry about these Ninevites and Assyrians molesting you anymore. Keep your solemn feast. Within 25 years, Jerusalem's gone, the temple's destroyed, and Judah is now in captivity. So again, God uses now the Babylonians as an instrument of judgment against Judah. Now, of course, a remnant uh, is preserved. But take heed, you who have the name of Christ on you. You who represent the Lord, consider the goodness and the severity of God. Look what he did to Israel. Look what he did to Judah. If the illustration about Nineveh is not enough for you, surely you should consider well the judgment and the captivity that was meted out to Israel and to Judah. How sad that so soon after Nineveh is destroyed, so is the temple in Jerusalem. Why? Because they got carried away with their wickedness too, and God would have none of it. That's how soon after that happened. So, we consider always the goodness and the severity of God. Peter says, um, since all of these things must be dissolved, right? This, this whole world is passing away. What manner of people ought we to be in, in holy conduct and godliness? What manner of people ought we to be? If we see these past judgments, and we know future judgments are coming, we know the Lord Jesus is going to come like a flaming fire taking vengeance on his enemies. And we read things like, of how much worse punishment do you suppose those will be counted who have trampled the, um, the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of his covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, These warnings are there for our admonition and for our growth. And if all of this is going to be dissolved and judgment is coming, what manner of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness? And if eternal, unspeakable, unfathomable joys await us in the presence and the absolute rest of our Lord Jesus, what manner of people ought we to be in all holy conduct and godliness? Let the example of Nineveh resonate with us, and there are many lessons in here. Don't discount the the timing, the judgment of God or his timing in it. Wait. Wait on the Lord. Be patient and be faithful to him. He is working things together for the good of those who are in the path of obedience. But woe to you who give him lip service an instrument of wickedness might be raised up against you. We thank God for all of these all of these lessons. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God-breathed and it is profitable for instruction, for repre- reproof. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness and a knowledge of him. Stay in his word. Study it. Meditate upon it it, and pray that he would open the scriptures, would open your understanding to the scriptures. Only he can do this. Pray for the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word that he inspired. And consider... What people ought we to be? What manner we ought to be? uh, What persons, manner of persons we ought to be in holy conduct and godliness? Cling to Jesus 
with all your might. And don't walk by sight, walk by faith. Much to be considered here. May the Lord bless whatever it was from him and use it accordingly. Until next time, God bless and Godspeed.